everybody. My name is Brian Berger, and I'm the editor of Space News, and I want to welcome you to today's webinar. Uh, this is part of a series of SN at SmallSat webinars we're doing this week, and today's Hello, webinar is on is DARPA's Brian Blackjack. Berger, I'm the editor of Space News, and I want to welcome you to today's webinar. Uh, this Today's Blackjack, uh, today's webinar is on the, the Blackjack program. Sorry about that. I was hearing some audio feedback. Um, before we get into that, I do want to share a few housekeeping notes. Uh, first, we're concerned audience questions. We are taking your questions. We welcome them. I do ask you to make sure that you submit them through the Q&A feature that is at the bottom of your screen. Please use that as opposed to chat. Uh, questions submitted through chat uh, will be ignored. Um, Q&A is, is the best place to put your, uh, your questions. It helps us sort through them. Um, I also want to say a quick word about a webinar we have coming up on Wednesday. Tomorrow, same bat time, same bat station. We'll be talking with Colonels Russell Tehan and Joseph Roth from the U.S. Space Forces Space and Missile Systems Center in Los Angeles about the future of national security space architecture and future capabilities. I want to say a quick thanks to Kratos for sponsoring tomorrow's webinar. You can go to spacenews.com to sign up. We will also post a link in the chat section at the bottom of your screen. So you can find a direct link to that as well. Um, so now I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to turn today's program over to Space News National Security uh, Reporter, Sandra Irwin, who will be leading today's discussion. Sandra? Thank you, Brian. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome, thanks for joining us today. I am really pleased today to have uh, with us Stephen Forbes, the Deputy Program Manager of the DARPA Blackjack Program. Uh, those, some of those of you that are not familiar with what Blackjack is, this is a critical program in space, in, in the Defense Department space arena, because it is how DARPA is trying to show how to possibly develop a constellation in low Earth orbit using commercial technologies. Um, but before we start talking about Blackjack, uh, we have a little bit of breaking news that Stephen Forbes will be the program manager of DARPA in a couple of weeks. Uh, you will be moving up, so congratulations, Stephen. Um, uh, this, is, this is exciting news. Thank you. Uh, so I guess maybe if you wouldn't mind uh, giving us uh, maybe a little bit, little bit of uh, an update. And before we do that, I should mention that Steve um, has been the DARPA Deputy Program Manager since 2018. And he is a, an aerospace engineer. He was, for many years, he was at the AFRL Air Force Research Lab space vehicles directorate working on small satellites. Uh, so he has an extensive background in space technologies. And uh, so now you've been at DARPA for two years. Uh, you're getting ready to move up to program manager. So uh, I guess uh, maybe I'll turn it over to you and you can give us an update. Uh, how is uh, Black Tech at this point? Where are you in the program and what can we expect to see going forward? Of course, thank you. Um, so yeah, you know, I've been on the program since 2018. Uh, you know, for all of our performers, uh, they shouldn't really expect anything to change. Um, you know, I share the same vision uh, that you know Colonel Tehan, Dr. Kennedy, you know Dr. Leahy, Dr. Walker, Dr. Heinem, you know, and everybody who who has essentially worked to make this program reality uh, before. You know, we're all still on the same page, and we're all still moving forward in the same direction. Um, so for those folks who are, you know, following Blackjack or who are new to it, you know, we're attempting to uh, find a way for the DOD to proliferate uh, space services uh, using LEO. Um, you know, normally when we build spacecraft, we build in the DOD very expensive spacecraft, um, and that limits how many we can uh, build. So Blackjack is an attempt to figure out what we can do from a DOD perspective uh, with lower cost spacecraft. Um, you know, historically lower cost meant lower performance, um, but, you know, thanks to commercial advancements, both in, you know, namely like the cell phone and, and microelectronics industry, as well as commercial space, some of those trends, you know, you know, there's an opportunity to explore those trends and whether that 
lower cost actually means lower performance, uh, whether that paradigm still holds. So that's fundamentally the program in a nutshell. Um, you know, we've been spending the last two years uh, sort of in our phase one exploratory, you know, because this is sort of, you know, a new price point and a new acquisition methodology for us. There was a lot of exploration. Um, that was phase one. So we took a bunch of uh, technologies and companies uh, through to PDR. Um, we've selected a good set of, you know, sort of things. And now the program is shifting into essentially phase two, which is where we will take, you know, a subset of what we de developed under phase one, mature that and actually go and fly and demonstrate as much of that capability as we can. Um, so that's sort of where the program is, you know, from our performers, we're going from exploration, uh, wide open as far as mission trade space. Now, you know, we're going to be turning the, the, uh, the crank and, and, you know, pushing them really hard to deliver an impressive set of capabilities on a, on a very, very short timeline. Um, you know, we've gotten great responses from all of our performers, all of our uh, partners in industry and, and the commercial world, including non-traditional ones. Um, you know, so I'm really looking forward to seeing what we create and, you know, what we're actually able to uh, launch next year. So I will, um, I will ask you another question and then uh, we will start picking up some questions from the audience that Deborah will be uh, bringing uh, to us. But uh, Stephen, I wanted to ask you, as far as why DARPA is doing this program and the idea that there is a very active and innovative commercial sector that is building uh, what they call the Leo economy, a lot of development happening, a lot of uh, companies uh, funding new systems and technologies. So what are some of the difficulties or what are some of the challenges that you think that DOD, DARPA have to overcome to try to get more capability in LEO for, for the Department of Defense? So, you know, we've got, you know, the, the challenges of one, um, you know, we've got we've got sort of the traditional DoD acquisition challenges, right? We're under we're under um, you know the unique uh, DFARS regulations, um, you know, and that makes us slower to move than commercial companies, right? We cannot simply get one or two people up our management chain to buy off and sign, and then you know essentially have a handshake agreement and off to run uh, the next day. You know, and and for for our larger companies, that's not an issue. But if you're trying to take advantage of a smaller startup type company, you know, we can be really slow getting money actually out the door, even once we've essentially decided that we really like them. So that's a challenge. Um, you know, that is something that that has certainly hit us on the program as we've tried a different acquisition approach. You know, we're not going to a traditional prime. We're essentially, uh, you know, because we wanted to explore different mission areas. Um, you know, we solicited for payloads and buses and our autonomy command and control element all separately. Um, you know, so we put a lot of workload on, on our DARPA and our, our partner contracting agents. And so that's, uh, you know, made life uh, slower as far as, as far as moving forward. Um, you know, on a technology standpoint, uh, every time we turn around, I think we're in the same boat that most other spacecrafts are, are in, you know, we're power limited. Um, you know, so for anybody who's building a bus, you know, um, somewhere, you know, bumping up the power that you offer, you know, seems to be the best return on investment from a technology standpoint, uh, from what we've seen that that's, it's, it's been universal across all of our mission sets and all of our payloads that a little bit more power would go a long ways to to improving, you know, the military utility of the constellation. Um, mm -hmm. As far as mission performance, um, across many mission areas, you know, we're not seeing, uh, you know, the inability to do the mission. We're seeing phenomenal performance, phenomenal military capability, uh, you know, out of these very, very low cost spacecraft. You know, we, we set a very aggressive goal at the start of the program of, you know, a $3 million spacecraft and a $3 million uh, launch to orbit. Um, you know, I expect our first articles are going to cost a little bit more than that. Um, you know, but I'll give, I'll give the props to industry, you know, they're not that far out of bed from that, uh, you know, sort of price point, you know, and so that shows sort of what you can do. And that really does enable the DOD to build those, uh, you know, 100 to 200 type size constellations if we can really get, you know, single digit million dollar spacecraft that, that actually, no kidding, provide a military capability. And I think we're, gonna, we're, we're well on track to demonstrate that. 
So you have a number of uh, missions that you will be launching as, as uh, experimental missions or risk reduction missions. I believe that there is you know, the, the pit boss, the autonomy system, there is the optical communications, uh, there are others. Uh, can you give us maybe two or, three, the, two or three technologies that you think are going to be the most challenging and that when will you be putting those uh, experiments up in space? Sure. So, um, you know, when we looked at what makes a, a LEO constellation useful for the DOD, um, one, you know, uh, we don't want to wait for store and forward, uh, you know, communications from and mission data to come off of a satellite. We want that data to come off very quickly. So the optical crosslinks are, are very, very important. Um, we also, you know, as you start to build more and more sensors in spacecraft in, in space, um, you know, the data starts to grow exponentially, which means you have to move your processing closer and closer to the sensor. Um, and so we sort of have two, uh, you know, sort of key areas. We have to demonstrate the ability to use, you know, more commercial processing capability. You know, so NVIDIA GPUs, uh, you know, Intel CPUs, stuff like that that is not normally traditionally done in spacecraft. So we've got a we've got a sort of risk reduction satellite that's going up there to to sort of take the first cut at the at the processing um, of the capabilities. And then we have a second uh, two satellite demo that'll be going a little bit later that is looking at those optical crosslinks because the you know they are you know, from a technology standpoint, um, very, very challenging, but also the, the best, you know, sort of uh, most data per watt uh, capability as far as moving data around the constellation, you know, such that the DOD has the data when it needs it, where it needs it. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, I would like to maybe go to Deborah and uh, see if we have some audience questions. Take it away. Yes, we do. Um, one of the questions is about the trade space for blackjack. How wide was the analysis of um, AOA? Analysis, analysis of alternatives. Right, analysis of alternatives trade space that DARPA considered. Did DARPA consider utilizing OTAs or other transaction authorities agreements for this program? So, so across on the mission side of things, um, you know, we basically said in our BAA, uh, you know, bring us anything that you think will hit that price point and show us why the military should care about that. So we did not, you know, target any specific missions. We really let industry sort of say, I've got a neat idea. I think I can get into this swap and cost, uh, you know, sort of target goal and go forward from there. Um, you know, and so we explored missions from, you know, sort of the missile warning, communications, um, traditional ISR type missions, PNT, uh, you know, we received weather payloads and, and basically everything that the DOD has ever thought about doing from space, you know, we received some sort of proposal um, and almost all of the things that we received from industry were very, very credible. Um, so we worked with our industry partners, you know, SMC uh, at the time, uh, AFRL, um, the Navy, the Marines, you know, all of our service partners to go out and sort of figure out which ones, you know, we wanted to tackle. And so that's how we sort of selected our, you know, 10-ish or so payloads that were included in phase one. Um, and then, you know, as far as on the contracting side, you know, we looked at um, all sorts of types of contract vehicles. DARPA is very, very flexible in our contracting. Um, so we have OTAs, we have firm fixed price, we have your traditional cost plus contracts, um, and we have SIBRs. So we've used basically every type of acquisition authority that you know, is available to the DOD for various aspects and performance, um, all based on you know, what the particular technology that we were acquiring was and, and how the company wanted to work with it. So, so some wanted to do the OTAs because they were non-traditionals. Others, you know, were more traditional and wanted the standard cost plus, you know, uh, fixed fee type things. And others were like, okay, you told us cost is important. We're gonna, we're gonna stick our necks out and, and prove to you that we really can, no kidding, do this and we'll sign up for a firm fixed price contract. Um, and all methods have worked and all methods have worked very, very well. So, you know, I think it's, it's the pick the right tool. Um, and there's certainly no one size fits all as far as the acquisition tools. One of the things that you'd mentioned there was weather, and we have a question, do you see a role for the blackjack approach 
and technologies in solving DOD weather observation gaps? I do. Um, I think that, you know, weather is a very, very credible mission. Um, you know, it was just, um, you know, weather has been an underserved area for a long time. Uh, and, you know, at the end of the day, our service partners wanted, uh, you know, they said weather is nice, but I'd much rather have a communications capability or a sensing capability or a PNT capability before, um, you know, so, so that's sort of why we went down that road um, was, was basically the services had to say, this is what we want you to do in sort of rank order. And, and you know, those sort of uh, three or four capabilities came out at the top across all the services. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I wanted to mention, um, Steve, really quickly, as you talk about all these missions, how does the ground portion of Blackjack work what is your expectations as far as does every provider have to provide their own ground system or will you have a DARPA ground system for Blackjack? So I think the, you know, ground is we're not going to ask every performer to have their own ground system. Um, you know, one of the DARPA hard technology elements that we're pushing is to try and, you know, minimize that ground footprint. Um, you know, there are there are tactical reasons to do that, and then you know, but the biggest driver is simply cost. Um, we can't take the traditional government approach of how many bodies we normally fly use to fly a spacecraft and expand that out across you know 100 to 400 spacecraft across multiple mission sets. So that's driven DARPA's push on autonomy. Um, and then when we looked at it, you know, trying to demonstrate a full proliferated Leo architecture, you know, an end-to-end -end architecture was too big to put into one, one overall program. And so Blackjack is really the space segment of that proliferated LEO architecture. And we're looking to our partners with SMC and the casino program to tackle the ground segment portion of it. Um, so they have responsibility for full end-to-end -end system, whereas the DARPA Blackjack joint program, so it's DARPA, AFRL, SMC, and then the Army and SDA were added in, you know, came in uh, focused on specific mission areas you know, SMC really has the stick for demonstrating that end to end what an operational LEO system would look like. And that really includes the ground. So we'll, we're gonna take a little cut at it, but that what we do on ground is primarily focused purely for flying our demonstration spacecraft. It's not an operational ground system. And that's our partners at SMC uh, and the casino program office will be going forward, you know, with figuring out how the DOD and the space forces and the services really actually want to fly and you know, and, and use the, the constellation operationally. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much, Steve. We have lots of questions coming in. So Deborah, please go ahead. Sure. Um, some of the questions revolve around new entrants. Is there an opportunity for new entrants to join this program? If so, how would they do that? Um, so unfortunately, we are uh, we're, we're, we've moved out of the exploration phase and very much into the execution phase. Um, so I think there's going to be very limited opportunities for new entrants. Um, you know, I think when I look around, when I talk with other folks, I don't. You know, we're not going to be the only proliferated Leo game in town. Um, you know, SMC has has great support for proliferated Leo. We are luck going to be lucky if we demonstrate two out of all of the different mission areas. Um, you know, so I see further opportunities through the labs, through through uh, SMC's prototyping dev, dev core, and through SDA for for entrance to you know sort of you know become involved in this proliferated uh, Leo architecture that the DoD is exploring. Another question revolves around launch. What are you? How are you planning to launch these satellites initially, and as this program goes forward? So, you know, one of the things that, that is a key sort of driver for our, for our swap constraints is in order to make launch costs tractable if you're putting up, you know, hundreds of spacecraft is you have to fit as many of them as possible on the launch vehicle. Um, you know, so we sort of set an internal sort of benchmark of we want, you know, 24 to 36 spacecraft on a, on a medium sized launch vehicle. Um, and that means for the demo, we're, we're well suited for secondary launches. Um, you know, because we're also trying to put them into similar orbits. Um, so I see us going as, as sort of secondary payloads, uh, whether that's procured through SMC or through, you know, on the commercial sort of, uh, you know, secondary market. I think both of those are opportunities. 
um, you know, we'll, we'll probably go commercial secondary for our first risk reduction, uh, you know, demos. Um, but we haven't, you know, uh, purchased our, our actual, you know, full up demo launches yet. Okay. Um, somebody else asked, I believe you mentioned that you'd be lucky to demonstrate two missions. They said, what two mission areas do you think those will be? Um, you know, I think that that obviously uh, an ISR type mission is 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 has a lot of uh, you know importance to our uh, you know community, um, and then you know communications is very important. And then I also you know I wouldn't be surprised if we managed to get sort of a missile warning, missile defense type uh, capability uh, you know up in, in some sort of limited fashion. Okay. Uh, and and people are asking where they can get more information on blackjack. Um, you know, so so uh, probably you know quite honestly, there's a you know thanks to Sandra and and Space News and everybody else and the dedicated team there. Uh, you can roll back through the archives on uh, Space News and get uh, probably the fullest picture of what's publicly available. You know, at the end of the day, we are still a you know a military program, and so we don't publish everything that. That we're doing, and and you know we don't share the full details of it. So, so I would say, suggest uh, starting from Space News and other publications. Um, you know, but there isn't a you know nice glossy website, nor will there be a nice glossy website that that explains everything we're doing. Okay, uh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to jump in with a follow up on one of your earlier points, uh, Stephen, about the uh, you're in a performing phase of the program, so there will be no opportunity for a new companies to come in. Will you be, uh, have all the contracts been awarded for all the major items or do you, are there still more contract awards coming in the, in the next few months? Uh, you know, it's, it's been one of the things on the program. I think we will be writing new contracts, uh, you know, until the very last day of this, uh, of this uh, program, you know, uh, Sometimes you know we have to prioritize resources, you know, and those include personnel on with on within the team and within our uh, you know contracting shop and everything else. So so I think you can expect to see future contracts come out, um, you know, and you can you know in the future there will probably be contracts uh, or announcements for launch and you know uh, for operations and support and other other things going forward, um, you know. We are out of the exploration phase, so I would not expect to see a BAA that says, bring us new payload ideas or bring us new bus ideas or bring us new, uh, you know, um, pit boss or autonomy aspects. You know, that said, I think that, you know, certainly the, the autonomy aspect is a focus here at DARPA. Um, you know, and there will probably be future autonomies. They won't be labeled blackjack. There'll be future payload opportunities. They just won't be labeled blackjack. Um, but there's a lot of that sort of enabling technology needs to keep keep being developed. And so those opportunities will remain available. Um, you'll just have to look a little harder and it won't come with blackjack and it won't be with my name on, on you know, the, the, as the point of contact. Mm -hmm. And one of, the, uh, one of the questions that I got from Twitter was about the Space Development Agency, which also is doing a LEO constellation. You mentioned that SMC is your transition partner. Is the Space Development Agency also a transition partner? And are you guys going to be collaborating on this experimental constellation or will they do a separate constellation and, and Blackjack will be a separate uh, system? So, so the satellites will be separately because they're built to different needs. Um, you know, we are the technology, you know, DARPA, the service labs, you know, our job is to develop technology. We're not, you know, most of our stuff needs another turn on it before it goes operational. You know, SDA and SMC DevCore are two of those agencies and organizations that provide that next turn to, to take, you know, a good idea that has been proven to work and actually turn it into an operational prototype. Um, you know, and then it can further an SMC or SDA go into an operational system. You know, I would say that proliferated LEO is a, a group of the willing, you know, it's a coalition of the willing and that includes, you know, all of the, the government acquisition folks and acquisition organizations, both on the S&T and the operational side. So we collaborate very closely with SDA, SMC, MDA, Army, you know, you name it. Uh, we, we all work to do it and we sort of, 
uh, divvied up the, you know, where are the technical risks, where are the programmatic risks, and, and we're each tackling a certain piece of that. So, you know, Blackjack is tackling really the price and the, and the performance capability for at that price point on the space segment. You know, SDA is like, okay, our operators, you know, and warfighters in the field actually have no kidding requirements. Like if you don't do this, this LEO capability doesn't add any value. So we have to actually tackle and, and write a requirement that says you must do X, Y, and Z, which we don't do on the S&T side of things. Um, and then, you know, SMC is there and it's like, okay, if, if, if the joint program of Blackjack is going to tackle the space segment, but to make it operational, we need to do all of these other things, ground, PED, you know, processing, exploitation, you know, we need to do something with the data, we need to get the data to, to folks, you know, and so they stepped up and are doing that portion of, of the proliferated LEO, you know, sort of mission area. And so we're all sort of separate, but we're all very well coordinated. Um, you know, we all we all go to each other's design reviews. We all sit on each other's source selections and everything else. And 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 you know, we've received here on the Blackjack program phenomenal support from you know from SMC, from SDA, and from all of our service partners, whether they are, you know, on the SNT side or the ops side, you know, telling us what is and is not useful to them. Great. Thank you. And uh, before we transition to the industry panel, I wanted to make sure we got maybe a, a couple more audience questions. If you have any final ones for Steve, uh, Deborah. Yes, I do. So Steve, one of the audience questions is about um, international suppliers. What were your rules for any international participation in Blackjack? So we actually have a, uh, a fairly good international participation. Obviously, you know, we are the DOD. We have a lot of policy and other stuff that, that, that we have to follow. Um, you know, two of our bus vendors have, have strong international com uh, components to them. You know, so one of our bus vendors was Airbus, uh, ADSI. They're a U.S. subsidiary, you know, foreign ownership mitigated, but they have their ties and the design of their Aerobus harkens back to, to Airbus and in France. And the other company is Telesat, which is a Canadian company. And they're, you know, so two of our bus vendors have strong international ties. On the mission side, it was a little bit more restricted, um, you know, because a lot of the missions do deal with more sensitive aspects of, it, of you know, either technology or of military needs. Um, you know, but we didn't, we didn't set any you know, must have or cannot have international participation. Um, you know, we're very open to partnering with our allies, you know, certainly in the demo phase and even in, you know, potential opportunities, you know, going forward in, in how they can play, you know, and work with us on, on proliferated LEO. Um, you know, most of our technology is at the heart commercial. These are, these are chips and, you know, other components that, that you or I could buy, you know, if we wanted to lay down the money from DigiKey or any of the other places, which means that Leo is one of those places that is a lot easier to collaborate with our international allies than, than some of the other things where it's, it's completely custom from the ground up for the DOD. Hey, Stephen, Brian Berger here. Can I ask you a quick follow-up? You mentioned Telesat as, as a bus vendor. Um, my understanding is that for Telesat Leo, there's still a three-way competition underway to select their bus provider. I think you have Airbus, Telesalinius Bus, and, and, and Maxar. Um, is DARPA kind of beholden to whoever Telesat uh, chooses to be the, the, the bus vendor, the spacecraft vendor for their constellation? Um, for, for the Telesat bus portion, yes, but I don't actually view that as a negative. Um, you know, Telesat as the constellation provider, the data service provider has, you know, writes the requirements. Um, you know, so they specify, you know, essentially how much payload accommodation for their modems and antennas and everything else. And so they're able to essentially share with us those, you know, those, those allocations, um, you know, and, and we can fit our payloads, you know, if they fit within that allocation, you know, we know that there's going to be, you know, we're going to have to figure out where we put inserts and, and how we do heat and other stuff, you know, to actually get a payload on whichever bus they select. Um, but we can, you know, those are solvable problems regardless of which bus vendor they, they actually go with. And so it really, you know, actually helps decouple and give us, you know, long-term uh, success in proliferated LEO because everything's not bespoke design for this payload for this bus, um, you know, there's sort of this mix and match, the ability to rapidly sort of move from one to another, um, 
know, it's not, it's not USB into a keyboard or into a computer right now, um, but it's far closer to that than when space has traditionally been when you're building an exquisite, you know, everything is tightly coupled design from the ground up. Um, you know, and so, so I think, you know, the Leo, working with Telesad and their, and their sort of vendor uncertainty has really helped us in that regard. When do you expect that uncertainty to end? When do you expect them to make a decision and let you know what bus they're going with? Um, I, I don't remember off the top of my head which date it is. You know, the only downside to that is, is you know, that's going to be a commercial decision for them, not a, not a decision on the blackjack program. We're far too small of a program you know, based on, based on their commercial things. Um, you know, from a selfish personal perspective, I wish they would have made the decision a year ago. Um, you know, but I think, uh, you know, when they make the decision, you know, all of the hooks will be there such that, you know, SMC or SDA or anybody else can come in and say, okay, tell us whichever bus Telesat does select is still in the competition for, you know, a future program of the record, you know, a future operational system. Thanks, Stephen. Back to you, Sandra. Thank you so much. And I would like to thank uh, Steve Forbes uh, for participating. We're going to transition to the industry panel. We really appreciate your time and giving us an update on the program. And again, congratulations on being named program manager. Hope, we hope to talk to you again soon. I'm sure we'll talk. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So, now it was my it would be my pleasure to introduce uh, four executives from companies that are working on the blackjack program. So first we have Eric Goodman. He is a Lockheed Martin program manager, and he is responsible for the integration of the blackjack satellites. And he is joining us from Sunnyvale, California. Welcome, Eric. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. We also have. Jason Kim, he is the Senior Strategy and Business Development for Raytheon Space Systems, and they're responsible for the missile warning overhead infrared payload for the Blackjack program, and he's joining us from El Segundo, California. Thanks for joining Thanks, us, Jason. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Uh, we also have Andrew Berg. Uh, Vice President of Business Development of Loft Orbital. And Loft Orbital is responsible for a, one of the experiments that Blackjack is going to be launching for the Pit Boss system. And Andrew is joining us from San Francisco, California. Welcome, Andrew. Hi, Sandra. Thanks for having us. Thank you. And finally, we have Bill Schum. He is the program manager for Blue Canyon Technologies, and they have a blackjack contract for buses. They just received a big contract to provide buses, and Bill is joining us from Denver, Colorado. Thank you, Bill, for joining us. Good morning. Thank you, Sandra. So I wanted to start with Eric um, Goodman. Uh, maybe if you can give us an update of how the integration of satellites is going to be done in the blackjack program. What are some of the challenges? What, how is this different from some of the other integration, uh, satellite integration that, that you're used to doing in, in the DOD market? If you can just give us a sense. And I will go around uh, asking all of you a question and then we'll go to Deborah for audience questions as well. So go ahead, Eric, if you wouldn't mind sure. starting out with just giving us an overview. Yeah, so we see our role in the blackjack effort as uh, the sort of last mile system engineering as well as um, developing the integration and test processes and flows that really capture that rapid test approach that really shortens the, the cycle times and uh, ultimately reduces cost. But um, really what, what beyond the cost reduction, uh, DARPA has a, a clear goal that they want to be able to quickly pivot, react, et cetera, to emerging threats. And so we're trying to work uh, common interfaces, common system engineering approaches that results in configurations that are very quickly adaptable, that we can very quickly change a configuration without repeating the traditional system engineering life cycle with requirements flow down, flow up, et cetera, and very quickly go straight from a design configuration specified to uh, integration and test. With carrying as much commonality and really leveraging the work that the 
the blackjack partners have already done to develop these payloads, develop these buses, pit boss, qualify those efforts, uh, qualify those, those products and, and deliver them with satellite integration and test in mind. So, so that's, that's really our piece of the, uh, of the overall blackjack effort. Um, some, of the, some of the strategies that we're, uh, we're working on, right now we're working with the providers to develop interfaces, both the um, mechanical and the electrical data interfaces, et cetera, that are common, um, high reliability, designed with integration and test in mind from day one. So we're not left with the task of troubleshooting failures that could, could have been resolved at the, at the, at the lower level. So uh, that, that's really a key enabler for the rapid integration and test. We're also developing processes for both the system engineering, sort of that last mile system engineering I mentioned, as well as the integration and test that um, sort of enable that rapid configuration defined develop the uh, uh, last mile system engineering and then get to the INT flow. Um, and we're also, because of the nature of this program, it relies extensively on um, collaboration with the providers. So uh, we are developing tools that really bring the providers into the satellite uh, INT process. Uh, we're developing a, a web-based tool that uh, we call SLOT that will enable um, all of the providers participating in a configuration to work online with both test procedures, uh, reference documentation, as well as actual uh, test steps, approval of test flows, resolution of anomalies online with us uh, so that we can prevent the, the classic uh, full stop as soon as we hit the first uh, red light on the console. Mm -hmm. Th thank you, uh, Eric. So Jason Kim, as a payload provider, how do you get the goals? How do you change your approach to, to building a payload to adjust to the schedule, the aggressive schedule and pricing goals that Blackjack has? I mean, I, I know that you provide payloads for, for DOD satellites that is a completely different schedule, completely different price point. What are some of the things that you're doing to try to meet those uh, those goals that, that DARPA has set? That's a great question, Sandra. Um, first of all, I just want to thank uh, Rusty for everything he's done for the Blackjack program and for the proliferated LEO architectures. And congratulations to Stephen for taking on the new role as the program manager for Blackjack. Uh, Raytheon, we're very grateful for the position we're in to help with accelerating this proliferated global persistent coverage of the Earth against threats. Uh, for missions like missile warning and missile defense, uh, we are uh, currently building a payload for OPIR. And uh, really, we're trying to move fast through the, the innovation with our Blackjack payload is in its simplicity. Uh, we're leveraging mature uh, technology to include advanced algorithms and optics. But from day one, it's been the primary design driver has been about uh, manufacturing for cost. Uh, at, at our preliminary design review in 2019, uh, we brought in all of our suppliers and, and partners and um, basically looked, in them, looked them in the eye and, and uh, made sure that we all had plans to uh, move fast and we're ready to move fast into production. Um, so we also, uh, take advantage of a lot of the commercial best practices in terms of uh, some of our commercial activities. Uh, we're building the Worldview Legion payload, which is a commercial imager. And so early on, we invested in advanced manufacturing uh, technology to include uh, 3D model-based uh, instructions for assembly and software-based uh, auto alignment for our optics and telescopes. So a lot of that gets brought into the Blackjack program to help us move fast. Uh, and finally, uh, we, we are uh, grateful to have the opportunity to show that we could have such a high-tech, uh, mission-critical payload that is at low cost. So we have invested in uh, high-volume manufacturing capabilities. We're using high TRL hardware and software from other programs that you're probably aware of, Sandra, that, that help us to move fast, but also affordably. Um, so uh, we are looking forward to having this OPR payload on orbit uh, quickly in the hands of our of our customers, DARPA, 
so that we can show the warfighters that this capability can be done fast. Uh, it, it could be a sophisticated uh, capability, but at low cost. Thank you very much, Jason. So Andrew, uh, Andrew Berg, Loft Orbital is doing a very interesting experiment and you're doing it all with commercial systems. You are doing this on a fast track schedule. Uh, you have, you're building a satellite. So the, the, the DARPA is going to be, DARPA experiment is going to be one of the CubeSats that you will be integrating on that mission. Tell us a little bit about that experiment and this being your first DOD contract, what is your expectations as far as what is the future of your company working with DOD? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Sandra. So Loft Orbital, um, we're one of the, the, as Steven said, we're one of the non-traditional uh, performers on this. So our job um, is we are flying a risk reduction mission to demonstrate and prove out certain key technologies of the pit boss, which is the autonomy and C2 and uh, onboard processing mission system, sort of the brains of, of Blackjack. So our direct partners on this are um, Scientific Systems Company and, and their team who are working under Seeker uh, on the pit boss. So Loft's job is to get the pit boss to space um, on one of our upcoming missions. It's actually an ESPA class spacecraft, about 100 kilograms, uh, not a CubeSat, so we're a bigger environment here. And basically give that pit boss the environment that it needs to perform its mission when there. Um, so we're integrating, onto, integrating it onto one of our spacecraft, giving it the comms environment, giving it the mission operations capability for uh, DARPA and DARPA's users to operate and command the payload up there. And really, um, and when we say payload, that's, that's the pit boss. So what we're integrating is uh, it's a pit boss mission system that's going to host SSCI and their team software. Uh, and then integrating that with an imager, uh, a remote sensing payload on the mission, uh, which is going to you know, collectively perform the mission of this, of this risk reduction mission. Um, and that's, I mean, that's Loft Orbital's core business is we're effectively, um, we say space infrastructure as a service or mission as a service company. And our job is to um, essentially be a one-stop shop to space to, to get our customers payloads into orbit on these high performance platforms uh, and let them focus on their core mission, be that to mature payload technology uh, or an enabling capability in this case uh, to perform a national security operational mission or commercial service. Um, in this specific instance, the, the pit boss risk reduction mission is launching on a, a loft spacecraft called YAM-3. That's uh, yet another mission three, it's our designation, uh, that's gonna launch early next year. So it was really important for DARPA to get this up uh, in a responsive way, in a, in a fast way, uh, to be able to get that system up there and learn from it uh, prior to the, the first Blackjack launches. Um, and one of the reasons we're able to get this up so quickly, and this is why we're kind of excited to be working with, with Blackjack, one of the reasons is that our, um, our commercial approach to implementing missions and our commercial tech stack that we developed since we started the company about four years ago is focused on some of the same core, let's say, plug and play principles that are, are central to Blackjack. I mean, one of the core elements that we see with Blackjack is it's very unique and groundbreaking way to approaching satellite design and integration. Uh, moving away from, from custom spacecraft towards using these commodity mass-produced buses to fly different payload configurations. So on a much smaller scale, that's what Loft is doing for our commercial business. Um, as an example, on, uh, on this YAN3 mission, the pit boss isn't, isn't integrating directly with the bus uh, from either a hardware or software perspective. It's integrated to essentially our Loft orbital interface. Um, and that helps us move quickly. Um, so we basically can have buses in inventory already um, ready to go, ready to take new payloads. We wait for the payloads. Um, and then, you know, to get to the second part of your question, Sandra, I think, you know, we as a company are, um, you know, we're in San Francisco, we're, we're a commercial, commercially oriented startup, but it's a core strategy of our company to be able to, to support these, these national security missions um, for the U.S. government, either for demonstrations like this, and then ultimately we hope to move into more uh, being, being a partner for operational missions. Uh, in, in different mission areas. So this review is a really important first step for the company. Um, and, and we're happy to contribute even in our small way uh, towards, towards demonstrating these important capabilities that DARPA and SSCI and the rest of the industry partners are, are developing and, and proving out. Thank you, Andrew. So I wanted to ask uh, Bill Shum finally. Uh, so 
I know you were in the Air Force for many years. Uh, you worked in at AFRL, at FMC, and acquisition programs. So now, as program manager at Blue Canyon, you're providing buses to DARPA for the Blackjack program. What are your expectations as far as how successful can they be taking commercial buses and turning them into military capabilities? And uh, potentially, I mean, how, uh, how do you think, how big do you think this program could get? I know that your contract potentially has up to 20 buses uh, with options. So how, how do you feel about the future in this program? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Sandra. So yeah, we're super excited about this. So yeah, as you mentioned, I'm an old Air Force guy. So plenty of years of, of frustration of, of big programs moving too slow, costing too much money. So not only we as a company at Blue Cannon are super excited, but me personally, I'm super excited about this because I, I do think it's very possible. So we're already moving out. We were awarded our phase two contract on June 10th. So we're up and running. We were ordering long lead items. We're getting ready for our CDR here in the fall. Uh, so we're moving out quickly, which we need to do to meet the uh, program schedules. So we're doing, you know, kind of even the, the basic stuff like structural panels for the bus. We're already ordering those. Uh, we have other customers. We have a very diverse set of uh, customer base. Uh, so our particular design for the Blackjack mission, it's based off our XSAT bus, what we call our XSAT. This is going to be the Saturn version. So it's a little bit larger uh, to host some of these uh, payloads that the uh, other providers are coming to, on board with. Uh, so in order to do that, we're, we're going in step with other programs that we have, MethaneSAT, ArcNot. We have other programs that are using the, the same bus. Uh, so we're making bulk purchases of, of some of the, the simpler things like the structural panels. Now, one of our advantages as a company is we do most, the vast majority of all the satellite components in-house. So reaction wheels, star trackers, uh, everything along those lines we do in-house. So that gives us an advantage in that sense. Uh, some of the other more complicated uh, items uh, that we haven't done as a company, propulsion, uh, we're going out of house for that. Uh, but regardless, we're moving out. We've been funded by DARPA uh, for phase two, phase three. Like I said, the total contract value award for that is $99.4 million. Uh, so on June 10th, if you heard some echoes coming out of the Colorado area, uh, those were our screams of excitement because uh, that's definitely the biggest contract as a company that we've had to date. Uh, and so we're pretty happy about that. So it's got obviously all of our attention uh, and we're moving out quickly. Uh, the bus itself is, is going to be the ESPA class. It'll probably be more likely uh, an ESPA Grande type envelope uh, when you're talking about the, uh, the size. Uh, the weight mass is, is, isn't that much of an issue for us. We're sitting somewhere in the 150 to maybe 200 kilogram for the bus side of it. Uh, all the different payloads are, are different uh, masses. So at the end of the day, the entire space vehicle will be just north of uh, probably 200 kilograms. Uh, the power is probably the biggest challenge for us right now on the bus side. Uh, these payloads obviously are, are, are very capable, uh, but then that throws it back on us to provide the power that they need. Uh, so size, not too big of an issue. Mass, not too big of an issue. Uh, but power is our biggest challenge. So we're working hard on that. Uh, but yes, to, to get back to your original question, Sandra, I think um, there's a lot of, of, of space here in LEO, uh, literally and figuratively, obviously. Uh, to do missions here for the DOD. Uh, so as an old Air Force guy, yeah, I'm super excited about that. Great, great. Thank you so much, everyone. So I want to go back to Deborah. Uh, we have a lot of questions coming in. So if you can, Deborah, if you can specify which panelists you would like to address, uh, which question, please go ahead. Yes, the, the first question is for Eric Goodman. Uh, one of the questions is, why Lockheed Martin developed a tool for model-based system engineering instead of relying on a current commercial off-the-shelf or government off-the-shelf tool? Hey, yeah, thanks for that question. So first to clarify, we're not doing traditional model-based engineering. Uh, the tool that we've developed is, uh, is called SLOT again. And the intent is to be a uh, single point, uh, both uh, tracking of all spacecraft in flow, uh, approval of uh, procedures, as well as executed steps, uh, resolution of anomalies, as well as the official repository for all design-related documentation across the Blackjack community. We're trying to uh, 
uh, make sure that uh, not only do we have an efficient process when we get into integration and test, uh, but because there isn't, this isn't a traditional program with a prime with requirements being flowed down, et cetera, uh, that we are enabling a, a system that prevents any communication gaps, prevents um, you know, both interface and uh, other uh, incompatibilities by openly communicating across the blackjack uh, effort. So, so that's really what, what SLOT is doing. Um, hope that answered the question. Yes, we, we also have a question about the COVID-19 pandemic and for any of the panelists, how this has changed the work that you're doing and your interaction with the government. Okay, well, I, I can take it from a Lockheed Martin standpoint. Um, I don't think we're alone in, in, in saying that this has certainly been a very interesting summer for us. Um, I think the, uh, the, the pandemic issue, it certainly presents some challenges. Uh, but it also has, um, you know, presented some, some unique opportunities. Uh, for instance, I mentioned the slot tool and the need to collaborate closely with providers, uh, leveraging VPN and other uh, remote technology to be able to closely collaborate with a very diverse set of um, hardware providers across the enterprise. So uh, the pandemic has, has sort of accelerated the need for that and uh, really driven home the the need and the value of some of those tools. So obviously we can't do integration and test virtually, uh, but we can certainly develop the, the, the tools as well as do the design phase effort that we're working on right now. Yeah, Deborah, I'll, I'll chime in on that one. Um, I think like any company, uh, we've had a little bit of impact in supply chain uh, through COVID, but we were in a, a fortunate position where the, the risk reduction mission uh, or the pit boss, the, or I'm say YAM3 that the risk reduction mission is flying on was already uh, already underway, already manifested. Uh, and we added this, this DARPA payload to it kind of as a, in, a, in a late stage of, of mission design. Um, so that's really helped us a lot in terms of because of those supply chains were already run, running and things were already in production. Um, we didn't have uh, too much of a, a COVID impact on supply chain for this risk reduction mission. Yeah, and at Blue Canyon, uh, we're in an interesting position. We're moving into a new, much larger manufacturing facility just down the road. So uh, we're based out of Boulder, moving over to Lafayette, Colorado, which is a little bit closer to Denver. Uh, but we have orders of, of up, up to 20 satellites that we have to deliver by the end of this calendar year. So our manufacturing facility is definitely hopping. Uh, and, and that's been a challenge. Uh, you know, we've shifted. Our workforce has been extremely flexible. And, and shifting schedules, you know, kind of making staggered hours, um, people working on the weekends. Uh, much of our engineering staff is doing whatever they can from home, but, you know, we're still um, adhering to all the, uh, the, the guidelines that are in place uh, and making it work, I guess, is the bottom line. Uh, but uh, as a manufacturing company, uh, it's definitely a challenge for us, for sure. Deborah, I guess I'll be last. Uh, you know, I think uh, Eric and Bill and Andrew all said it best. Uh, you know, we have the remote infrastructure. Uh, we have the policies to protect our our employees. But uh, to echo what Bill said, it, it comes down to our um, our tremendous talented people. Uh, they're just showing their resiliency every day by working together as uh, in a collaborative environment and, and working together through all the uh, commitments that we have on the Blackjack program. So I, I, I throw it back to just the, the tremendous talent we have on the team with our engineering fellows and our program managers, systems engineers, uh, technicians, um, just uh, world-class. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Jason. I wanted to maybe go back to one of the points that Steve Forbes made. Uh, DARPA is trying to create a cost model for the future for LEO satellites, for DOD. They really don't have good models right now. They really don't know how much they should pay, how long they should take. Uh, maybe like, I'll go to Andrew Berg. I mean, you, you're, you're, you're trying to do this totally new business model on the commercial side. What are some pieces of advice that you would have for DARPA as far as how, how can you uh, line things up so they can actually have a good process in the future for buying more commoditized systems, for buying more off-the-shelf systems and accelerating the, the production? 
in our, our strategy when we put together missions, um, any of our missions, is essentially to take down costs for a very similar reason, uh, or let's say a very similar uh, way that I think DARPA is trying to do it with the same sort of philosophies, uh, which is for us to take non-recurring out of the system. Um, so basically we, we look at these commodity spacecraft buses um, that we can take and use as they are and preserve their flight heritage. And then our cost is basically uh, procurement of commodity items and integration and test. Uh, whereas let's say the payload specific adaptations you might have to make to a bus or handle the level of, of loft orbitals modular interface. Um, and that's one reason why we're, we as a company are really happy to see government programs like DARPA and also big constellation programs uh, resulting in the, the setup of these, these mass manufacturing assembly lines that are coming out of places like Wukanyan. Um, Cause those are fantastic for our commercial missions, which we're doing at a much smaller scale than, than DARPA is for, for blackjack. And, and I, I think to answer your question, well, the professionals at DARPA are much, probably much more sophisticated cost modelers um, than we are as a, as a small business. Um, but, but I can only imagine they've probably seen some of the same benefits in terms of costs coming down by embracing these sort of standardization approaches. Mm -hmm. and, and Eric, uh, Eric Goodman, what about your perspective as far as how successful do you think uh, this program ultimately will be in trying to, to make a new uh, cost model or some new benchmarks for the future for LEO systems in DOD. I know you work in all different kinds of programs. So what are, what are some lessons uh, that probably have to be learned going forward? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, DARPA just by their, um, their uh, origination of this program recognizes some of the challenges of the traditional large spacecraft uh, programs and has already taken you know, some steps to, to resolve those. So really, I think what's gonna make this program successful and really produce product that is uh, something that could be well leveraged across you know, uh, multiple other DOD customers is uh, the concept of um, defining you know, clear, uh, well-defined interfaces, leveraging existing technology without modification and really resisting that urge to uh, you know implement a slight improvement to, to go chase a, an additional uh, bit, bit of performance. So uh, you know DARPA is, is intending to fly long, large constellations so the individual performance of any one spacecraft uh, you know can can be slightly lower, the reliability can be slightly lower, et cetera. So it's really just sort of resisting that natural engineering uh, urge to, to innovate and improve. We've got, you know, great buses uh, from, from Bill of Blue Canyon and other, uh, other vendors. We've got great technology coming out of Raytheon and other providers. Uh, and, and really, we, we don't want to break what, uh, what, what works. And that's really what's going to make this program successful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We're really uh, at the top of getting to close to the top of the hour. So I would like to thank everyone for your time. This has been a really interesting discussion. I really appreciate you all joining us and maybe I'd like to turn it over to Brian for any closing comments before we sign off. Thanks very much, Sandra. And thanks to all of our guests. Thanks to all of you here in the audience. Um, just want to remind everybody that we have another great webinar coming up tomorrow that's called Innovation in National Security Space, Small Sats in the Future Architecture. Still time to sign up for that. That webinar is made possible with support from our sponsor, Kratos. I also want to thank the Space News team for doing a great job of covering small sat. We're only a day into the conference. The sessions, the live sessions are just getting started after this one wraps. I just counted there's already 15 small sat stories posted on spacenews.com. I encourage you to visit the website. Uh, if you want to make sure they're sent to you, just go to spacenews.com slash newsletters. If you're signed up for any of our newsletters, you will receive um, the SN at small sat newsletter we're sending out every morning at 10 a.m. Eastern. Uh, both to highlight the day's events and to give you a, a quick rundown of the news that we've gathered uh, basically in the past 24 hours. So that's it for today. See you tomorrow. Thanks, everyone.